This episode of the Topcast is proudly supported by Music, Beyond Sheet Music. When we want someone to sing, you know, we have to, we really have to model that. We really have to let them, you know, hear our voice. Mm, yeah. They have to hear us make mistakes with our voice. And one of the things that I recommend and that is such an effective warm up, but also um, it's just a wonderful way to help students. And I do this, I torture students of all ages with <laughs> these exercises, but like vocal exploration and allowing the student to explore their voice in playful ways is a beautiful way to alleviate some of the worry. Well, teachers, welcome back to the Topcast. It's a very special episode today because I'm interviewing another music teacher podcaster. And if you've ever wondered, or maybe you've been a teacher of voice students, and I mean, I know many of you are, then you're probably familiar with today's guest, Nikki Loney from The Full Voice. She has a fun, fantastic podcast for voice teachers called The Full Voice Podcast and has some great strategies and suggestions, tips and information about why we all can benefit from our students doing some more singing in instrumental lessons and also some super simple tips and ideas for how to get started if that's not something that you currently spend a lot of time doing, which is totally fine and totally understandable because most of us were not brought up with much singing in our lessons unless you came from maybe Suzuki or Kadai or off approach, if you had more of a traditional classical upbringing from sort of 30, 40, 50 years ago, then chances are you probably weren't encouraged to do all that much singing. But there is so much benefit to be gained and it's why singing is a core part of my No Book Beginner Framework. If you haven't already seen that, then just head over to topmusic.co slash beginners where you can find out more about how I teach in those first three to 10 lessons without any reading and out, out without any method books. But there is a lot of singing, chanting and um, clapbacks and musical conversations and percussion and all that kind of stuff because it's so important. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about why we should be including uh, singing in our music lessons. So today's guest, Nikki Loney, is a voice teacher, podcaster and vocal music resource creator from Canada. Nikki has been working with singers of all ages and abilities for 30 years. She discovered her teaching inspiration came from her youngest voice students. Her evil agenda is to inspire teachers to welcome young singers into their teaching studios. And her publishing company, Full Voice Music, has been intriguing voice teachers with fun and educational vocal music resources for more than 20 years now. Welcome to the show, Nikki Loney. Oh, Tim Topham, thank you. I'm a huge fan. It is an honor to be here. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you because we have a lot of, of your fans in our community and on our team and have talked about you and I've been doing some research and you're doing incredible things for the oh, voice voice students and teachers of the world. So I'd love to just hear a little bit of your backstory, actually, because I do have a lot of piano teachers and business people and authors and things like that. We haven't had such a focus on voice, which is what I'm really excited to focus on today. So, tell us a bit about how you came to be doing what you're doing now. Oh, sure. Well, I uh, I have sung since I was a young girl. My dad was uh, a singer in the um, R&B era of the Toronto, and he loved singing and he sang with me, played the guitar when I was wee, wee, wee. And uh, so music has always kind of been my journey. And uh, I was a performance major. I went to school for jazz. And um, like many teachers uh, and performers, I found that performing was inconsistent for income. So I, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, and so a friend of mine recommended me for uh, a teaching position of which I had no business taking that job, but I did. And I was thrown to the wolves and um, I started teaching out of necessity. And in my first few years, uh, it was really not enjoyable at all. Right. I, I joke, like it was, a, I needed the money. I was young and I needed the money. Was that teaching in a school or a, like a local school? Music it was school? a small, small music school. It was a music store that had uh, lessons in the basement. Right. And it was, it was a little dark. What a lovely scary. place. <laughs> 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 Lots of natural light flooding in. Yeah. No, no lights, just a closet <laughs> in the basement. But um, 
I just, I had everybody. I had little ones and I had adults and I had teens and I, I had to figure it out. And back, oh gosh, this is going back 30 years. I didn't have any colleagues, so I didn't really have anyone to bounce ideas off of. And, uh, I really struggled in the beginning. And, um, I made the mistake of complaining to my dad that teaching was this horrible, horrible thing. And it was so horrible. And he, he, he's an entrepreneurial spirit. And, uh, uh, he was like, you don't complain, you fix the problem. So, <laughs> and he, and he's like, either quit your job and get another job or fix the problem. And, and stop complaining. And, and stop complaining. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so I I realized that the place that I was working wasn't really conducive to colleagues and learning and growing. So I found a new teaching facility and I talked to other teachers. And one of the things that kept coming up time and time again for, for me was um, there was really a lack of vocal resources. So mm. we were always trying to piecemeal things together. We'd take some piano resources and we'd look at some violin resources. So we were always trying to find materials that would work for young singers. So when I met my colleague, Mim Adams, she was also frustrated with the lack of curriculum for voice students, young voice students. And we just kind of started our evil journey, our plan of, <laughs> of trying to put together a curriculum that honored the vocal instrument and honored the young voice student. And that was like 30 years ago. And, and strangely, she's still my friend and <laughs> we still work together. And uh, it's been an incredible journey. We've met incredible teachers from around the world. And uh, uh, we just, I'm just in awe of the community that has grown from our efforts. And it's been, it's just been so much fun. Mm, that's, well, that's, that's what it should be, right? right. Uh, did you, did you, as a child, did you learn an, an, an instrument other than voice? I took piano f uh, lessons, not as, a young child, uh, my parents had three kids. They could only afford one activity. So I got singing. My brother played hockey and my sister did baseball. But when I was a teenager, I actually paid for my own piano lessons. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, because I, I knew that I wanted to continue post-secondary and I knew that I needed to have piano skills. So I used my money that I earned from my part-time job and I I I lived out in the country and I cycled like over to the next concession road to have piano lessons. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> but so crucial for voice teachers though, isn't it? I mean, having reasonable piano chops does help a lot. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't call myself a, an amazing piano player. I would I'm a functional piano player and uh I I enjoy playing the piano, but if I'm teaching, I find that uh, I, I struggle sometimes because my brain is listening to the students sing and then mm. my brain isn't focused on what my fingers are doing. So there you go. Well, I've wanted to speak to you for, for some time because I, I'm also quite passionate about the power of singing for any any instrumentalist. If you can sing it, you can probably play it. And if you can sing it, you can probably play it better than you could have played it before. Mm -hmm. um, but so many of our, us as piano teachers, predominantly piano teachers, we, we were never brought up to be encouraged to sing, many of us. And mm -hmm. it can be quite awkward, not only singing ourselves, but encouraging our children to sing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've talked before about how blown away I've been when I've really pushed my kids to sing, even those teenage boys in slightly awkward times with their voice changing and things like that. And they've come out and they've got this incredible voice that they never knew they had. So I know, I know you, you, you're right on the same, on the same um, playing field here. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this importance for singing for all instrumentalists. Oh, gosh. Um, well, first of all, for anybody that's listening that's, that's encouraging um, students to sing and giving them a safe space to do so, that is such important work. And, and kudos to you, Tim, for, for encouraging them, especially the boys, right? right. Like the boys, they need to have that role model. You know, they need to know that it's okay. Mm. 
There's so many benefits um, for singing. And I mean, f just on a physical, uh, for health, like just physical. So singing releases endorphins and singing, you know, strengthens the lungs and it, it makes you, it helps you express yourself. It, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to regulate emotions and it can really be an amazing outlet for a, a student. From a developmental, like for children and babies, I mean, they, the recommendation that we sing to our babies, I mean, that's how they learn language. That's mm. how they learn sounds. Um, singing is very much a wonderful tool for the language center of the brain. So there's just, there's so many benefits and so many reasons why encouraging people to sing is so just wonderful. The other side of that is that singing is such a vulnerable thing. It's such a vulnerable act. And I, I, I was just talking to a colleague the other day and like I've been teaching for oh, 30 years and I don't think I've had an adult student come to me over the 30 years that doesn't have some sort of like trauma story mm. or experience where they were made to feel like made to feel insecure about their voices. There's a lot of, there's a lot of insecurity and vulnerability there. So when we want someone to sing, you know, we have to, we really have to model that. We really have to let them, you know, hear our voice. Mm, yeah. They have to hear us make mistakes with our voice. And one of the things that I recommend and that is such an effective warm up, but also um, it's just a wonderful way to help students. And I do this, I torture students of all ages <laughs> with these exercises, <laughs> but like vocal exploration and allowing the student to explore their voice in playful ways is a beautiful way to alleviate some of the worry. Because if we get into worrying about pitch or trying to make corrections, it can really shut down a student. So when okay. you give them exercises, like my favorite go-to, and I share this all the time, and uh, I always get emails like, oh, I tried your vocal roller coasters. I couldn't believe how effective it was. So we do a little game in the studio. I think they were originally called vocal expression lines, but my kids called them vocal roller coasters. And just taking a like a whiteboard or you could do this on your Zoom um, if you're doing screen, online, yeah. message, mm -hmm. you could do it on your whiteboard screen and you just draw a line. So you're doing a, like a roller coaster up and down yeah, kind of wavy like line? Yeah. Yep, I, I, I'll say, what color do you want me to use? And I'll be pink, and I'll draw this big pink line. I said, okay, I am going to sing this line. And I just pick a vowel, and I make it very dramatic, and and I just follow the line. So you're going, oh, and all this yep. kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. Yep, and their faces are like, whoa, okay. <laughs> and it's interesting, not only is it a wonderful uh, way to uh, encourage them. It's an amazing assessment tool because if you get a student that maybe they're not quite sure and maybe when they go to sing it, you say, okay, maybe you'd like to sing that now. If they keep the pitch set really small, you kind of know that they might they might have some insecurities about making those sounds. Mm. And then Say, ooh, that was a very, that was a very good roller coaster. I wonder what happens if your roller coaster went higher. And you just you just play around until they hear the sounds and maybe they giggle a little bit. Mm, yeah, yeah. And that is such a it, it it gets them breathing, it gets them using different parts of their register outside of their speaking range. And it's so non-threatening because you're not making corrections. You're not asking them to match any pitches. You're not setting like a, a, a like, let's see if you can do this kind of parameter. Mm. And it really just opens things up. So anytime we can explore and have, have fun and just be silly with the voice, it's like, it's so beautiful. And then, of course, you turn the you hand over the whiteboard marker, or you you allow them to annotate on your Zoom screen, and then, of course, they'll draw a crazy line. <laughs> swirls and yeah, with swirls and crazy, and then you just go for it. You're just like, okay, I'm going to sing that. You wait, I'm going to totally sing that line. 
And by reversing it and letting them be the teacher and, and make you sing something crazy, you are meeting them at where they are at rather than asking them to meet you and to do all these things that might make them feel vulnerable. Mm. So vocal well, exploration. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love I really, really like that. Uh, such a simple idea. I can picture it, I can see it being super useful. And I, and I think that's a mistake that I've definitely made and many teachers listening have probably made where they've approached singing when they've needed to for an assessment or an exam or preparing sure. students for a scholarship or whatever it is. And suddenly they go from no singing but playing their mm. instrument for five or ten years to having to match a pitch or pick the middle note of a three-note chord. Or And these are just incredibly difficult things to do for most people unless mm. the child is blessed with some kind of perfect pitch. So I think that's that's a really great go-to first activity for a student. And and any teacher listening could try that with any student, mm -hmm. new to their studio or not. What about for the students that you're taking on at age six or seven? I mean, you could do the roller coaster, obviously, but what are some of mm -hmm. the initial things that we as instrumental teachers can do with those students so that five years down the track, they're quite confident singing and more comfortable? That is a great question, and uh, I I'm a huge uh, a huge supporter of using the solfege system. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, with the little ones, I definitely use the hand signs. The challenge sometimes with um, singers, uh, and and I always try to encourage this, is allowing them to internalize sounds uh, and to get to know their voice. I, I call it making peace with their voice. So I love using solfege. And when it comes to matching pitch, uh, and this is a mistake I used to make all the time, you, you, would, you would go to the piano and you would play middle C. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that for some kids, middle C is actually not a comfortable note and that's not where they might be successful starting. So if you use movable dough and solfege, you can move the tonal center to wherever the child wants to be comfortable. Um, and, and you ask them to like, like let's sing do re mi. And then you allow them if their pitch drops a little bit, or if their pitch goes up higher, that's where they kind of want to be. That's where they naturally would like to sing. Mm. And then you, again, you go to where they are most comfortable. And then you can take like really small little fragments like do re mi or repeated notes, do, do, re, re, mi, mi. And you just play call and answer. And again, um, with the little ones, that physical activity, getting them to focus on the hand signs can help to alleviate a lot of the wiggles and the busyness and the fidgety because mm -hmm. they've got something to focus on. But it's also a visual for them, which can help them to develop their pitch. So if, you, if you're doing any kind of work, back and forth, voice to voice, using hand signs, finding the key that works for them is lovely. And again, I used to, I used to get really worked up about, you know, okay, we're going to start on C and you have to find that pitch and, oh no, a little bit higher. Or mm -mm. we really get worried about when, when, when children struggle with pitch and and it's not, it, it's something that usually works itself out if we allow them the space to just work and, and hear and feel and explore. And it does get better um, with just simple phrases back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Mm. Is another alternative to the, uh, you know, here's, here's a pitch on the piano and you sing that, to have them sing a pitch and try and find that pitch? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, that's good because that's something that I've done before. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just getting I'm just getting uh, your, you know, blessing oh, on no, what I'm I doing love now. That. <laughs> and that also that also I think that's very um respectful of the student, you know, like you show me where you want to sing cuz I'm going to find that on the piano and now I know where you are at mm. rather yeah. than you have to find where I am and hopefully that pitch is comfortable for you. Right. But I love that. I love that. We yeah. I play a game with my students where 
one of my students, she's a, she's a little smarty pants and she does take piano lessons. So she'll often, she she comes to her zoom lesson and she'll be like, Nikki, I'm going to sing a note. You have to tell me which note it is. And I'm like, Oh, Esther, it's been a long day without playing it. (laughs) Without playing it. (laughs) She's like, I'm pretty sure it's an F. And I think she might be one of those children with like really good, accurate pitches, like perfect pitch. And I'm like, Oh man, she's going to test me today again. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Can you get it? (laughs) See, sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. Bring your scores to life with Maestria by Music. Maestria is the first optical music recognition technology powered by artificial intelligence. From a simple picture of a paper score, Maestria can create an interactive live score that you can listen to, speed up, slow down and transpose. Live scores are compatible with music and any music notation software or digital audio workstation. Find out more about music and Maestria and create your first live score at music.com slash Maestria. That's music, N-E-W-Z-I-K dot com slash M-A-E-S-T-R-I-A. Music, beyond sheet music. So doing doing uh, using that Kadai approach, Solfege, right from the early lessons. So if you're taking on, if people are listening and they're working with preschoolers or really mm. young kids, uh, or any any new beginner, I guess it, it does become harder in the teenage years and adult years. So definitely because people get yeah. so much more reticent to sing. But mm-hmm. if you if you make it, I, I've always found that if you normalise it from the beginning, then it's not such a big thing. It's when you suddenly, after four years of teaching a student who's never sung, go right, we're going to do some singing because you need to do it for this oral test or whatever. That's when it becomes difficult. So. For teachers listening, perhaps would it be valuable if they had a spare even two or three minutes in a lesson, just oh, every, every lesson or every couple of lessons, do some, some kind of singing work. Yes. And, and I think that, uh, I think that can be such a valuable exercise. Mm. And I, 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 I mean, you, you talk about all the different activities that, you know, piano teachers can do to keep their students engaged. And it, I mean, it's the same with voice students. We, we, we you know, we want to, we want to do rhythm and we, we want to work on pitch and vocal ability, but we also want to work on musicianship. So I think enhancing the lesson and make normalizing singing and singing for the students, uh, singing with the students. Yeah, lots of modeling. Mm. Lots of modeling is just so, so beautiful. And I would like to just, I had a student many years ago, a young man, and I had him, he started with me like when he was like 11, 12. So he was just starting to go through puberty, just starting to go through voice change. Mm. And there, he would really truly wasn't comfortable singing. And, you know, I tried my best and I, you know, we changed keys and I asked him to bring in the music that he wanted to sing. And it was a real struggle for a couple of years. And mm. I, I found, and he eventually discontinued lessons and I wished him well. And then I find out like five years later, he's a lead singer in a man. No way. And he's writing his own songs and, and singing is something that he absolutely loves. So <laughs> we all, as educators, we know that we might not see those results in those first formidable years of learning, but you don't know what influence and what seeds you put. That's amazing. And you give them the permission. They just might not be ready for it mm. when they're with you. You mm. just never know. Yeah. And and I used to be particularly uh, hesitant to get my teenage boys' students to sing. But I've, I, as I've said, I've, I've found out that many of them, I mean, some of them, yes, they, they really do struggle if they've not been brought up with this as an approach, but mm-hmm. others suddenly find that they've got a really nice singing voice. They could sing in pitch and they really quite enjoy it. Uh, an, another tool that I've used, now tell me if this is a bad thing or a good thing. <laughs> okay. What do you think about kazoos? Ooh, kazoos are a wonderful tool. Oh, yes. Okay, win. Because <laughs> the thing that I love about them is that to get a sound out of a kazoo, you have to hum a pitch into it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not quite singing. Kazoos are a wonderful tool. Actually, I want to shout out to my friend Dana Lentini, who's also an advocate for working with young young singing students. She 
when somebody signs up for her studio, they get a welcome package that includes a whole bunch of things. And one of the things in the welcome package is a, their own kazoo. <laughs> All right. And that's, she uses that. Um, and I've used that as a, like a warm up, right? Because you do have the kazoo, you have to have quite a bit of breath energy mm. to make it sound. And yes, you have to, you have to sing a pitch. It's a wonderful warm up. And there's a disconnect because it's not their voice making the sound. Right, it's yeah. Instruments. So again, if you have a student that's maybe anxious or, you know, not comfortable with making the sounds themselves, a kazoo can be a wonderful introduction to a well done Tim. Oh yes, all right. <laughs> Approved by Nikki. That's good. I'm happy. Um, and what what kind of improvements or outcomes would you expect from instrumental teachers who start? encouraging more singing in their lessons? What, what would they see in their student or hear in their students? That's a great question. I think when we vocalize a line, um, I think teachers could pro pro will probably see um, perhaps more expressive phrasing. Mm -hmm. So let's say we're talking a about a piano teacher. Sometimes it's helpful depending on the type of learner. Maybe you're working on articulation with the hands. Well, if you vocalize it, it, it can actually help. I, I, I have a lot of colleagues who are phenomenal uh, piano, uh, well, pianists, but also piano teachers, and they will sing phrases for their students and ask the student to sing the phrase to help with the, the musical shape of Shaping. it. Shaping, yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, too, you know, for I've always, I always tell my, my singers, my teens, I'm like, you know, if you can play an instrument and sing, you'll be more likely to get a background vocalist job, right? Because, <laughs> you know, there's more gigs. Or, or more busking. Schedule. I mean, there's <laughs> lots more ways to make money. <laughs> <laughs> right? But um, I also think, too, with um, internalizing pitches and sounds, like if, if you're looking at a score and you, you want to sight read it. Like whenever I look at a score and I have to, like, you know, I'm going to play it or I'm going to sing it, I always kind of sing it first. It plays in my get head. Get a shape so for it, it in your head. I yeah. get a shape for it in my head and I can vocalize it. I, I know a lot of teachers that will sing a phrase rather than play it for them. Or if they are trying to change um, the attack. Uh, I know uh, I have a lot of friends that are, teach violin and, and they will they will use different like scat syllables for mm. different bowing, right? right? So again, vocalizing sounds can help us explore the instruments differently. Mm. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's so much value in doing it. I, I really hope people listening, if if you know, if you're not currently, if there's not an element of singing in your in your lessons, then I hope this will make you consider whether that's that's something that you could do. Really, really great, great to unpack some of those ideas, Nikki. Mm -hmm. I'm really keen to find out a little bit more about the uh, the podcast. So you're a podca fellow podcaster, yes. which is why you sound so fabulous on the microphone. Oh. <laughs> uh, shout out to my husband who has all the fancy gear. <laughs> okay, full disclosure, full disclosure. I said, oh no, no, I'll just do it. I'll just do it on my laptop. It'll be fine. He's like, mm, no, I'm going to set up the microphone for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't get away with it. You're, I mean, I can get away with it because I'm not a vocalist, so I can. Uh, you know. <laughs> Tell us when did you, when did you start the? So it's called the Full Voice Podcast. When did you start yes. it, and um, how's it all been going? Oh, uh, so we started the Full Voice Podcast five years ago. We're just finishing up our fifth season. Wow. Okay. Well, I started 2015 too. It must have been similar yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. And and we kind of started it as a. An experiment. Mm -hmm. um, I I was writing a lot of blogs and I was writing a lot of articles and I didn't feel that I was getting any response. I wasn't getting a lot of comments and writing is a lot of work. And mm. my husband kind of said to me, he goes, you know, you do talk a lot. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you should have a podcast because we have a recording studio here at the house. And, uh, I, at first I was like, oh no, no way. Who would, who would listen to a podcast about teaching voice? Like who would listen to that? But, um, we put it out there and the first year, I mean, we, we just got such a great response and, um, I mean, our, our niche market is, uh, voice teachers, um, and we we talk to uh, voice teachers from all over the world. We I've interviewed people uh, from 
everywhere, including Australia. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's been such an amazing experience. And I have to say, as a, as a teacher, uh, having the opportunity to talk to all these incredible educators has totally enhanced my teaching oh, yeah. and my, like I have learned so much mm. and I've been in awe of my guests and, and how, how their contributions. And I know that I've taken every single good tidbit right back to my teaching studio. So for me, it's been just enhancement. We changed our format this past year. We went to like a show format. So now what we do is we have like uh, we have like um, expert returning guests. So I have a voice teacher who's also a social media expert, and I have a voice teacher who's a business expert, and I have I bring on um, the teachers that are experts in pedagogy, and I have vocologists that talk about anatomy and all things the the science of singing. And then we bring on uh, featured guests, and we just discover some amazing things. And it's been it's been incredible. Oh, like so you I, do all that in one episode? Yeah, ah, like a variety show. Almost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so and uh, and it's been uh, it's been. I mean, it was challenging because we went from the one guest per episode to a whole bunch of guests per episode. Mm, so, mm. so my team, we really had to streamline our organizational uh, strategies and how we manage all the content and everything. And it was a little crazy for a few months, but we really, we really like the new format. That's cool. I'm going to have to check that one out. Get some tips. I like it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, you started in a, a very similar time and, and for a very similar reason as well. I was finding that, uh, blogging while I love writing, writing it, it, it does take a lot of time and I mm -hmm. really enjoy just chatting with people and meeting them. Yeah. And I thought, why don't I just record this and, and share it? Uh, it's just such a fun medium. Um, so congratulations mm -hmm. on your successes through that. Ooh, and that's led you. to some publishing, some books. So tell us about those as well. Well, our publishing company existed before the podcast. All right. Yeah, so Full Voice Music um, – uh, my colleague and I, who, uh, you know, were scrapping it out in the early days without any resources, um, we started by just creating one page activity sheets and we tested it on our students. We compiled it and long story short, after about five years of research and testing, we, we released the full voice workbooks and, um, the full voice workbooks were just, a an organized curriculum that allowed teachers to structure lessons and include the musical foundations of music theory and, um, rhythm reading and learning to read music, but presented in a way that, that honored the singing student. And we, we started, like we self-published, we started very small, sold, you know, a few hundred books here in Canada and they, it just, it just kind of blew up from there when, when we launched our e-commerce website back in 2014 and uh, it just, it was, people were like, there's nothing like this for singers and this is so helpful. And uh, and then this past year, we've actually partnered with children's songwriters. So we have Donna Rodenizer, who's here in Canada. She's in Nova Scotia. And actually our other children's songwriter is an Australian mm -hmm. by the name of Lynn Lehman. So he, he runs Song Library. He's down in Adelaide. Cool. Yeah, so we partnered with the children's composers because voice teachers are always struggling to find age-appropriate repertoire, and now we offer single-song downloads and music that's crafted for the younger singer. So our our company our company mandate is really truly just to create resources for the young voice student and resources that are fun that are educational that make teaching much easier for for the the voice teacher and it's been it's been a long journey but we the books are sold worldwide that's amazing yeah, yeah. congratulations thanks it's really great uh and i know that there are a number of vocal teachers and teachers of piano and voice i mean they're, mm -hmm. they're quite common really in many ways so where can people mm -hmm. go to find out more about those books and and your podcast well, uh, they can visit our website, which is thefullvoice.com. 
And I would highly encourage everybody to check out our free resources page because we share fantabulous little (laughs) free downloads that uh, most of them are based on vocal exploration and having fun. And we just put out, you would love this one, Tim. It's called Pretty Itty Bitty Kitty Unicorn. (laughs) And it is a... (laughs) It is a vocal warm up tongue twister and it's just it's just fun. It's just fun. And yeah, so if if you go to thefullvoice.com, you can find all of our resources there and the podcast, but definitely check out the free resources page uh, where you can try out some of the songs, warm ups, tongue twisters, teaching games. It's all there and you can dip your toe in and have some fun with you. That's too. super cool. Yeah, in my uh, earlier career, I did a lot of musical theater conducting. Ooh. Mm. So, yeah, I, I used to always be looking on the lookout for various warm-ups to keep people inspired. <laughs> Actually, I didn't really enjoy ever doing warm-ups with, with students, but if you find the right ones, they can be quite quite fun. I've, I have yeah. conducted a lot. I, sh- I mean, it's not my area of specialty, but I've always been thrown into conducting choirs and, <laughs> and groups of singers and musical theatre, so I know all those things well. I love that. I love that. Uh, conducting, I, that's one thing I, I struggle with. The, with the keeping the beat and then pointing at people. Oh, yeah. Well, Can't put those two things together. It's a whole art form. <laughs> of we, like, and I've been on courses. I've conducted <laughs> orchestras and bands, and it's all different. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like becoming a jazz pianist. Like you have to mm. almost learn the whole instrument again. It's another yeah. whole complete art form in itself, conducting. I'm, I'm in awe of great conductors mm-hmm. and what they do. Although it's often mis- misunderstood, really. People don't think they do very much. Anyway, <laughs> that's that's subject for another podcast. For sure. Nikki, anything to kind of wrap things up with? Any final thoughts for the teachers listening? Well, first of all, Tim, I want to thank you for this opportunity. It's so lovely to meet you. Pleasure. I, uh, I, I've, I've been following your podcast and, and what you do. What you do for teachers is fantastic. And if I can leave teachers with, with just a little little inspiration. Right now... There are families looking for teachers, voice teachers for their kids. And parents are recognizing that their children want to sing and are inspired and find joy in singing. And they are looking for professionals to help their children and to enrich them. And I, my evil agenda is always to encourage teachers to welcome young singers into their studio and to give them that safe space. So um, there's huge opportunity. And like you said, you know, there's just so much benefit to singing and in our lessons, we can enhance them. So I, I, want, to, uh, I want to encourage people, send a virtual hug to everybody. If you're creating those safe spaces for singers, it's truly an amazing gift that will give that person confidence for their lifetime. Amazing way to finish. I can't say anything else except thank you so much, Nikki. <laughs> thank you, Tim. This is wonderful. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Nikki. Do go over and check out some of her resources and um, make sure you try out some of those ideas for getting your students, if you're a piano teacher like me, getting them singing in lessons. There's so much that can be gained from it. And you'll be surprised. You may have some amazing singers in your music students. Next week on the podcast, we've got another member spotlight. And our member spotlight's a little bit different this time because our member, the member that we're going to be introducing to you next week, had uh, quite a revelation, even an epiphany, one might say, when they were really feeling burnt out, down, and struggling, and really not looking forward to teaching day to day. And just one simple change in mindset and change in thinking completely shifted everything that they did. And she's now absolutely enjoying her lessons again. She's taken on a completely different perspective. And we're going to find out what the simple shift in her thinking was, how it came about, and the impact that it's had on her and on her students. That's next week on the Topcast. Until then, I'm Tim Topham. You've been listening to episode number 246. Make sure you check out the full transcript and show notes at topmusic.co slash episode 246. And we will speak to you again next week. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. 
You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.